Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Uh, this one I'm going to cover inside of Halo, how to do contracts with billing plan combos. We want to talk about charge rates. We want to talk about how the charge rate is calculated. We want to talk about where to apply the charge rate um, and just cover some practices. I'm not going to call them best practices because everyone has their own way of doing it. And Halo by design is flexible enough to be used through any mechanism. Um, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna show you what's available and then you can choose what you want to do. Uh, so I'm gonna log into a brand new uh, demo tenant. And let's jump right in. We're gonna grab our 2FA code. Uh -oh. uh. This one. And we should be in. Yep, there we go. So while we wait for this to load, um, there are a few things to think about when you're talking about contracts, when you're talking about billing plans, and when you're talking about templates, what that, what that actually is, and when you're talking about charge rates. So first, what I want to talk about is we're going to go look at the charge rates directly. So I'm just going to search for uh, charge code, uh, charge types. There we go. That's what it's called. And you can build you can build out different types of charge rates here. So you have remote support, on-site support. I'll throw some more out here. I'll do like project work. Then we'll do, go back and do like uh, yeah, professional services for like consulting maybe. Um, and then we'll also include like knock org or something like that. Now, again, I'm not showing best practices. I'm just throwing out uh, an idea about how it's built, okay? So if we look at the remote support, which is uh, pre-built thing, we see the use is labor. It's not linked to an item, which is where you would set the charge, the tax rate if there was an item you want to link it to. Or you can tie it to a product ID, one of the two. And then this is how it comes out on the invoice itself um, and whether or not it's going to be used in a specific agreement. So here it'll be global, and you can just leave that alone. Here you can link it to an item that'll uh, tie it to an account code. So if I do something, well, labor is not in here, but if I were to do a generic item, then notice the account code goes away because um, it's set by the item you're linking it to. Uh, other options you have here are travel or labor. We're going to leave it on labor, and we're going to look at rates. So under the rates tab, you have the ability to build out specific uh, start rates, like a like multiple a rate table almost for specific days that will allow you to uh, set a rate depending on specific conditions. So first of all, what is the base rate? Um, let's say my base rate is 350, so I'll put in 350. The rate override of a prepay, prepay balance does not cover the entire charge. The following rate will be used to pay as you go. Only applies when using prepay as an amount and pay G for when prepay runs out. Set to zero to disable. So right now it's disabled. But let's say we had um, a deal which I kind of do. The deal, like my my pricing is broken out, where it's three fifty an hour. Uh, if you prepay in a block of ten, it's two eighty an hour. So I can say, well, if you prepay at all, it's always going to be two eighty. So then I would just override the rate at two eighty, like that. Um, so that way, if there's a prepay balance, then it'll just set it as uh, two eighty. Now we can also say, well, if it's project, we want to override that with the project budget rate, so it's controlled by the budgeting itself. Um, that's something you can do specifically for the project charge rate if you wanted to. In this case, we're going to say minimum minutes is uh, 15. Fill every 15 minutes. Um, increment minutes is how often you uh, increment. And again, it's 15, so it's going to round up to the nearest 15th minute. Um, so that way, you're, you're going to start the minimum of 15 minutes, and it's always going to round to the nearest 15 minute. Now here you have an OOH multiplier. This is out of office hours multiplier. So if you're after hours, how often, how much do you want to multiply? So one and a half times or 1.25 times, depending on 
what it is that you're doing. Holiday multiplier, again, if it's a time, time and a half, right? So it's 1.5. Um, and then if you're using contract hours, applying after all other multipliers, then you can actually, uh, again, apply multiplier on top of that. We can do things like use the agent's working hours instead of the SLA for multipliers calculations. And we'll come back and talk about what that is exactly. And then you can apply a surcharge if you want. And we'll come back to this. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. Generally speaking, you'll just have one rate. And this is what it's basically going to look like, uh, setting to what the specifics are that you want. So let's go ahead and cancel out of this. I didn't really make any changes that we want to save. Uh, let's just cancel out of this. We have multiple different things. And uh, we would go through each of these and build out the same kind of deal that we would have. So if there was prepaid labor or non-prepaid labor or project labor onsite versus project labor offsite. So you can come in here and say onsite support that would over be overridden based on project budget rate. So if there's a project budget applied, it would override that rate there. Um, so that's something that you can do to save yourself on on charge types. Um, now we're going to talk about what where these actually get used. So if we were to look at the teams and agents and jump into an agent, and let's just look at Mendy, then if you go down, you'll find that there is a default charge type here. For me right now, it's no charge, but you can set that to be a default charge type of project work or professional services, one of the two, right? So now any work that I do is going to go under this charge type. So if I go into a ticket and then I go find uh, something here and let's just find something here and put some time in real quick. And I'm going to say it's going to be an email, but I'm going to disable the emailing real quick and just to enter some time, we'll put in like 10 minutes. Um, the charge type here is set to no charge. So this is actually going to override. Let's back this up a moment. OK, so let, let's let's open up a couple new tabs here. And let's just go back and talk about a few more things. So we talked about how on the agent, we have the charge type is set here to be professional services. But we also have in here, if you go look at the ticket type. So you go to ticket types. And this ticket type specifically is the ticket type of incident. So we'll come here and look at incident. You'll see that under the incident default, there's another charge type. Uh, maybe it's here. There we go, charge type override under details. And you can see it's set to not set right now, right? And then if you go to actions, so if we come back here and look at actions, and we have the email user button, and then in here, we've got defaults of charge type is set to no charge. So if I edit this, we've got three places that we can set the charge type. We've got charge type override here, we've got charge type here, and we also have a charge type here. The way it works is, is that the agent, the action, sorry, will always override the ticket, which will always override the agent. So if we don't have it set on the ticket and we don't have it set on the action itself, um, so if we come back in here and say, and then we remove the charge type field, save that, then what we'll see, um, I don't actually, I think what we do is just exit that out, right? Um, hmm. I think that's actually a, let's go ahead and put that back in there. And then we, let's, let's hide it to say that it's not visible. And we can do this by saying it depends on a field that doesn't exist on the ticket. So let's just see how this works. I think we just ran into like a minor bug, but let's find out. Basically, what I'm trying to showcase is that if we do uh, action that's not set, it will follow the agent charge type. So now charge type is not set. I'm going to uncheck this. I'm going to put in you know five minutes, and we're going to say testing 
charge rate, and we're going to save it. And we should see the charge rate that gets used. Professional services is from taken from the agent. Okay. Um, you can view edit action, and you can see that specific under the billing details. You'll be able to see. I don't know why it's going so slow right now. There we go. Time tracking. Professional services is the charge type, and then you'll also be able to see whether there's any prepaid hours and whether there was a contract billing that override, what contract hours were used, and what billing plan it was done. Okay, so this takes us to the next step, the billing plan. But before we get there, I just want to highlight, like right now, it's professional services because that's what I set the agent to over here. But if I come to the ticket and I modify this ticket to be uh, remote support and I save it. Um, now, the way the tickets are broken down are, are these tabs mean something. A default is a setting that gets applied to a ticket when a ticket's created. Uh, the details are the settings of a ticket, regardless of whether or not it's been created or was created. So if I understood my, that correctly, assuming I'm saying the right things and I'm not saying it wrong, if I come back here and do email user at this point and undo that, then we should actually be pulling the charge rate from remote support, right? So at this point, even though um, that's interesting. Hold on one second, I did something different. Okay, email user. Yeah, I don't know what I did because it was showing me the charge type field. And the, the idea is to not have that because if you have the charge type field, then you're setting the charge type at the, at, on the action level. And we want to not do that. So as we're testing the charge rate type on the per ticket level, and we're going to hit save. And what we'll see is now it's remote support, right? So again, a side tidbit here is that these tabs, detail, details and defaults are two different things. So anything you set here under details will be applied immediately to tickets pre and post, making that change. Um, they will be the new setting for existing tickets and new tickets and so on and so forth. Anything you change on defaults, however, will only apply to new tickets that you're creating. It will not apply to existing tickets because the defaults map to a field that exists on the ticket, and those fields are values that have already been set. So, for example, one of the fields is to, um, let's see, show to end user, right? Another field is to exclude from SLA, right? So these are options on the defaults tab. I can come here and change it, but it doesn't. It's not going to change existing tickets. You have to actually add those fields in here. We just got way off track, but if you notice, there's an exclude from SLA, and here's a hide from user, uh, show to end user field. So you can add these to the ticket, and then you'll see them appear on a per ticket level. So that way, you can modify the tickets that already exist after you make the change for all future tickets. So again, it's just understanding the foundation and basic theory behind Halo's design will allow you to figure things out and learn it better. The defaults tab is going to be changes to fields that you can that you that will apply to future tickets. And those fields already have values set to existing tickets. They will not impact existing tickets. You can add those fields in here in order to go back and change them on existing tickets. Whereas details are settings that apply to the ticket type, and those settings apply pre and post making a change to all existing tickets and all new tickets moving forward. Um, so that's what we just showcased with that charge rate. Now, going back to the point of this call or this video, the charge rate specifically. So we saw the professional services is when we're the agent that doesn't have the charge rate overridden anywhere else, not on the ticket, not on the action. And then here we see that it's on the ticket type. So if you look at ticket type under details and we look at charge type, you see now it's remote support. If we're looking under team and agents and we're looking for charge type, we'll see it's professional services. So the ticket type is overriding the agent. It's literally a charge type override. Now, if we go to actions and we come here and change this default, again, remember default uh, to actions is going to be Again, setting values of fields that may or may not show up here. So in this case, we're not putting the field in. It's still hidden. We're just going to change the default to on-site support. And I'm going to save it. Now I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to refresh it. It's not going to change any previous actions because those are fields that have already been done. 
but I'm going to do a new action and I'm going to say charge rate type override. I keep using the wrong language by saying charge rate, charge type override action level. And then we'll put four minutes in there and we'll save that and we'll see it on site support. So this is the tree of how the evaluation works. If you have a charge rate, a charge type override on the action, it's going to override the ticket. And if you have it on the ticket, it's going to override the agent. And if you have it on the agent and you don't have it anywhere else, it's going to always fall back to the agent. The agent is the final stop of what happens. Okay. So we covered how the charge types get created. We covered how to calculate the billing amount based off of like it's literally just a time taken times the rate, which is what will show up on the invoice. Right. So time taken times rate is what gets put on the invoice for that charge type. And then we saw how you can control the charge type based off action, based off agent based off ticket. And we're basically almost done here. We just have to tie it all together to contracts. And we have to tie it into um, one last piece, which we'll come back to at the end. So let's just talk about contracts for a second. Um, contracts are designed for you to provide. It's an agreement, of course. I just used a different word for the same thing. But it's an agreement with, the, with your client that says, hey, I will do XYZ for this amount. So you either have some sort of negotiated terms. You have all you can eat, or you have a certain amount of hours included that you don't bill for, and then you only bill for hours after that, or you have a negotiated rate where non-contract is a higher rate and contracted is a lower rate, and so on and so forth. So you've got these things that you can uh, that you, you can you figure out, and um, what you do is let's looking at a customer. So let's just pull up Terry's Chocolates and jumping into the contracts. For uh, if I can find them, agreements. I guess they've been reworded in this language pack. So this is the agreement for uh, Terry's chocolates. You can see the start date. You can see what type of it. What type? Let's edit it. Um, we actually can't change the labor type, uh, which is funny. Let's make a new one real quick, and let's just. Go through the options here. Terry's chocolate is going to be it. Agreement reference is just going to be a name for the for the agreement. We're going to generate something. It'll be something automatic. And here you can see whether it's prepay or whether it's fixed. Okay. Now, if it's fixed, how often are you going to be charging that? How often is that labor being charged for? Is it yearly? Is it monthly? Is it six month every six months? Quarterly, so on and so forth. Most of the time, you're doing monthly as an MSP. Okay. Next call date is going to be like a CRM thing. You don't need to have it, but it's a, like you can pull a report and you can give out tasks and appointments to hit that next call date and push it out. So that way you're staying on top of the contract and you're maintaining that relationship. Um, end data type is either after uh, three months, after six months, exact end date, or no end if it's uh, an, an always renewal, automatic renewing contract. The hours per period is going to be. Um, the, where you specify how many hours are covered by the agreement. So let's say you you did all the right stuff. You've got your charge types created. You've got your contracts in place. Now the contract only covers the first 10 hours. How do you make sure that after 10 hours, the contract is no longer consuming that labor instead of not instead of, because like when the contract consumes the labor, it doesn't get billed. You're billing for the contract and you're not billing for the labor being used. Um, in, in some cases. So how do we make sure that the hours that are being consumed by the contract are actually uh, not more than what you sold? And that's this is what you specify. You specify that here and say, well, every five, every month they get a block of five hours. So I want to say 10 or I go by 10 hour blocks, I mentioned. So I'll do 10. Every month you get 10 hours. And then uh, after 10 hours, the price goes up or the price or we start charging you for the labor instead of uh, instead of what we were charging on a contract. Um, or you can do unlimited, right? So MSPs are often doing all you can eat now. If you do unlimited, then it will just eat up all of the hours and it will always be consumed by the contract. The cost per period is basically your operating costs based off the contract. If there are uh, products or agents or something like that that you're putting on there, you can throw it in there for calculation. Um, it's not a required field. And then you've got some contract types, gold, silver, and bronze here uh, that will describe what the contract does. Again, it's it's not required. It's just uh, a way for 
you to know what package it is. And then you've got, again, more subtypes, and then you have the status, uh, which you should set to either live or confirmed um, at some point. Then you've got the date sent, date received, and now you can do an SLA override based off the contract. Right, so this is just some of the things that this goes this goes back to how Halo is built with a method or mechanism for you to cascade a bunch of the same setting for different places. And then it takes based off a of priority which setting to follow. Similar to the charge type that cascades from agent to ticket to action, you have the same idea with SLAs, which you can do based off uh, global SLA versus site SLA versus contract SLA. Um, Surcharge will actually allow you to set what surcharge. So that goes back to that checkbox we saw, like surcharge in the uh, in the charge types, and then the template for what the contract looks like when you print it out. Some additional information about the contract and notes, and that is the main screen. I'm going to save this, and we're going to notice, like here, we've got charge types. So here we've got a billing plan combination. These are what billing plan methods will be used for an action. So in the event, um, there's a difference between a charge type and a billing plan. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, so if it's unmatched, then what do you want to happen? Again, we'll come back to exactly what that is. Oops. We've got the charge types specifically. So remember how we saw charge types that uh, were tied to an agreement versus global? Here you have the ability to create charge types specific to the agreement. And then you have the ability to override a rate. Uh, so if you remember that we had charge types um, here. So here we can choose a charge type, remote support, and we can override the rate specifically for this contract um, with the same exact settings. And it's just, a, it's just a per contract override on the same exact charge types that you would already have. Okay. Assets and users are just a way for you to say um, which users or assets are consumed or included by the agreement. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Associated sites are the sites that um, that are linked to the contract. Now, again, notice this right here. This tab is not used for billing and is just informational. Use billing plan combinations for this if the per site is required. All right, we'll come back to that. Recurring invoices and invoices are just invoices that exist under the agreement, but recurring invoices are ones that will happen on a periodic basis, and invoices are one-off ad hoc invoices. Periodic history will show you the changes that have been made and ongoing usage of that contract. Documents are collection of documents. You can literally drag and drop files in here, or you can click, and it will ask you to browse to pick a file. And then a schedule will show you uh, the ability to allocate a time into the contract. Um, so you can create a schedule plan and figure out uh, constant communication and, and when you're going to be working on it, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, here you have the ability to include any kind of agreements with vendors, where you can search a vendor contract and then include it in here. Uh, so you can store contracts from your clients' vendors in, and link it into this contract as well. Um, so let's go back to the billing plans, because we just went way off track here. I did not want to go through all of that. But billing plans will allow you to specify a criteria through a map that, again, follows a cascading list of how it should be invoiced. OK, so you already have. The charge type. The charge type defines the rate. It defines. It takes the total time taken. It's considered billable, and it multiplies it by based off the rate using multipliers for out of office or for on holiday or whatever other settings you specified. But how does it know to actually bill the invoice versus just consuming the hours and displaying it under like financial reporting, right? So this is how you do it. The billing plan combination is basically combination of multiple different billing plans that, uh, again, cascade together to provide a single strategy for billing. So here you can choose, first of all, you have to set a sequence. And the lower the number, the first, like the higher it is up the list, right? So it runs from lowest to highest. And it was stops matching on its first match. So when you build these out, you want to go from most exclusive to most inclusive. or least inclusive to most inclusive or uh, most exclusive to least exclusive. It's all I'm, all, I'm saying the same exact thing just six different times so that you can understand what I'm saying. Right? You want to be very, very, very 
specific on top and very narrow in general at the bottom. Um, because the first one that matches is gonna it, that's gonna be what it goes with. It's like Outlook rules. So we're gonna set this as zero and we're gonna say any site that happens specifically for ITL ticket types of incident, charge type of remote support, that's gonna be an all you can eat. Now I don't have to specify incident. Again, I'm just being mostly specific here and therefore um, I'm putting that on the top. So now I can say like within working hours versus outside working hours. If it's inside working hours, I can say now it's covered by the contract. Um, oop, I don't want to do that. I can now I can say this is covered by the contract, right? Now if you notice, like I don't have other options here, but if I were to jump back to the client, um, if I were to jump back to the client here and move over to the billing tab and scroll down, there's a billing plan combination here as well. And if you notice, there's a pay-as-you-go option here, pay-as-you-go, treat and match, pay-as-you-go, pay-as-you-go, right? So this is weird because like, I don't have the same setting here. I don't have a pay-as-you-go option, right? But I do have one here. And if I save this for a second, and then I'm just going to close this out and refresh this window. And then go back to the billing plan combo outside of the contract. I'm going to go to billing. I'm going to go to billing plan combinations. And you'll notice I now have two of these. OK? But if you, if you look here, I've got sequence two versus one. And it's referencing a contract, reference Terry 001. That's the one we just created. Um, and this setting does not exist inside the contract. So the point is, is that well, every other setting does exist, right? When you create your billing plan combinations, especially if you have multiple contracts, you want to do it from the customer side. You don't want to do it from the contract side. And down here, if you scroll down, you can see you've got pay as you go. You can say prepay, so it consumes prepaid hours. You can choose a different contract. Um, if I were to choose a different contract and say, well, this is for uh, professional services, they've got a different contract for professional services. So that'll go there. And again, we don't care about the site or type of ticket. Actually, we can say, advice other uh, or projects, right? As the ITIL ticket types. And then we can say, we don't care about categories and we only do it within working hours, right? So we don't offer outside hours support for this. And then we'll contract it to the GP001, which is the one that was already existing. And let's save that. Now, if we go looking, we notice we're automatically signed as three se sequential uh, sequence, the sequence ID three. Wow, I need to learn how to talk. Um, not talk as fast, at least. If I go back to the agreements and then go to GP0001, 0001, yeah, and then go to charge types, you'll see this billing plan now exists, right? So what, you're, what you want to do, basically, the lesson for that is you want to make sure you're looking at the billing, the billing plan combo from the customer side because you're not from the contract side because you will be missing part of the picture. Clearly, you're going to be like, here, what the heck is going on? Every time I put labor in, it's getting billed against the, uh, the client in an invoice. And I don't know why I have the contract set up. You don't realize that it's because you have this page you go on top. So you can come in here, you modify this to say four, you save that. Uh, you have to set all this up because apparently um, there and save this. And then if we're lucky, it just reordered them and now it's at the bottom, right? So now it's this are most inclusive and then this is most uh this is least inclusive, right? It's very, very, very specific, and this is very vague. And then uh it gets to pay as you go. So it'll hit that one last. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that honestly, unless you have something specific set here that's special, like if it was against prepay or something like that, you don't need a pay as you go option because the very last unmatched action if you don't match any of these things you're, it's going to be pay as you go okay and you can have that go to, towards the global setting which is pay as you go right now where you can say don't invoice at all so that way you're only invoicing match labor instead of invoicing all unmatched labor right so it all depends on how you want to do it and that's how you design it so now that we've gone over the billing plan combinations i want to talk about the billing template so if you notice, selecting a billing template will alter the client's billing plans and prepay configuration. 
Interesting. What is that exactly? Let's go back to configuration, go to here, and just search template. And sure enough, we've got a billing template. And if you look here, we've got hmm, everything covered by contract. These are existing templates that came in the system. So if we open up remote support, you see it's the exact same screen. Right? And if we go to, oh, I went too far. Let's go back to billing templates. Everything covered, we see it's the exact same screen. Now you can build out these billing templates to be however you want. And when you specify the contract, you just choose a contract here, right? You don't choose the contract from the customer because it'll automatically map to a, co a contract that exists, okay? If you have more than one contract from the customer, you may have to go and override it in that customer level. Um, but if, generally speaking, ideally, if you're doing mass management, you only have one contract per customer, and then the billing temp plan template will just match to that first contract or that only contract. One of the other things down here is that uh, you have the ability to say, if a billing option is set to agreement and no agreement exists for the customer, one will be created automatically with the following configuration. So you can choose what that configuration is right now down here. And that way, what will happen is you don't have to go around creating all the contracts. You just create the billing plan combinations, and then you apply the template. And then when the template's applied, it'll automatically create the, the agreement. Um, there's a button somewhere I'm looking for. I don't see it right now. That'll allow you to push the template to any customer that has it. I don't know. Maybe it's because they don't have it mapped. Let's come back here and just say remote support. Now that remote support's applied, we'll save this. Let's go ahead and refresh this and hit remote support. And there we go, update customers button. So you have the ability, if you've made a change to a billing plan, you can go update customers and it'll update all customers that are tied to that billing plan. Okay, so that combination is how you can do very quickly mass management of billing across um, across Halo. You build your charge types first. You determine your strategy for when you use charge types against tickets versus agents versus actions. And then you build your billing plan template. And then you apply the template to the customer. You just go through like this customer gets that template, this customer gets that template, and so on and so forth. Um, once that's done, assuming you don't, if you don't have contracts, it'll create them for you automatically. And for the most part, uh, unless you need more specific reporting or some of those features, you can go ahead and uh, create them automatically from the billing plan, or you can go modify them after the fact. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, oh, one of the other things that we have the ability to do, which I said we would cover and I didn't, is that if we come here and add another one, we have the ability of specifying that a user or an asset must be covered by the agreement before it will be before it'll cover this thing. So um, every ticket is assigned to an agent. That ticket has a user associated with that. It's a contact, either general user or a real contact associated with that ticket. It's one of the things I said on the very first videos from MSB Geek. Every ticket must have one agent. Every ticket must have one user assigned, where agent is a technician and a user is a customer. Um, additionally, you also have the ability to associate an asset with a ticket. So if you did have an asset with a ticket, you're able to set up a billing plan that says, hey, yes, we have a contract that covers all the work that happens. It's an all you can eat. But we only cover contracts that we have an agent on. So therefore, the asset must be covered by the agreement. And then tickets that get worked on when there's no asset on there or when the asset attached is not an asset covered by the agreement, they don't apply. Right? So this billing plan doesn't actually work. And it skips it and goes to the next one, which would be pay as you go, and then you get invoiced. So that could be a way that you allows you to do work on non-contract systems and automatically bill for it versus doing work on contract systems and you don't bill for it. Right? Because the billing plan basically states that in order for it to be billed, it has to be covered by the agreement. So I'm going to cancel this for a second, and we're going to go back to the agreement just to uh, show you one other thing. We talked about the assets and users. So this is where you would go to associate those assets. You come in here, you choose the asset, confirm selection. 
you would set a value and a sequence and whether or not at what point you want to stop covering that asset in the agreement. Um, I don't have to specify them. I can just leave them zero and then they're covered. I can say, well, the value of the asset is, I don't know, $50. And now the agreement total value is $50, right? If I'm charging 125 per asset, then 125, right? And now the agreement value is 125. So, that, so from a reporting perspective, I can see how much the contract is worth because I have X number of assets multiplied by the value or sum up the number of, in reality, it's really summing up the value of all the assets together to get me a total contract value. Um, and that's how you associate. So now if the ticket has this laptop associated with the contract, it'll get consumed by the contract. But if the ticket doesn't have this laptop associated and it has a different asset or no asset, then it won't get it consumed by the contract. And the same thing can apply to the user as well. And you can, again, add users here. You can say the user, Terrence, is considered as part of the agreement. You can say for them, we're charging a 350 user, 125 a workstation. And we can click Save. And now we have the user associated with the agreement, where the total agreement value is 350 and 125 for the assets. And your charge type, your billing plan combo, would just say user must be associated with the agreement or computer must be associated with the agreement. So you can use this if you have like a mix, all you can eat remote for workstations, but then all you can eat on site for servers if the servers are somewhere local. And then by doing that, you can say, hey, if it's a system covered by the agreement, which would be servers, then everything's covered. Remote on site. If it's not covered by the agreement, on site is billable, remote is covered. And billable just means it's going to be pay as you go. And covered means that it's still technically billable, but it's just consumed by the agreement. And it's very important. I keep saying consumed because at some point, you're going to have to look at the, co at the contract and say, hey, is this contract worth it? Am I making enough money from this customer so that I can sustain their relationship? And the way you calculate that is you take the total cost, cost of the agents, cost of your employees to work on it, how much time you're spending, right? So you multiply the time spent against the cost of the agent, uh, as in, wow, I keep saying agent now, <laughs> a cost of the use of the technician of your employee who is in Halo's term an agent at this point. And then you take that, it's again, time taken times cost, uh, for each agent that did any work on the contract, you take all that, you sum it all up, and you take the cost of what it takes to do management on each of the assets, which is the computers, which we call agent <laughs> on the RMM perspective. We take the total cost of all of management across all the um, endpoints, and we add it together to the cost for uh, providing services from our technicians, our employees. And then we say, okay, Here's how much the contract is costing us. Let's say it costs us $3,000 a month. Now we're charging $1,200 a month. Then we're losing money on that contract. And we need to be able to report on that. So in order to report on it, we need to bill for that time. Even though it doesn't actually get invoiced, it gets billed against the agreement. So we can pull a report and say how much time is being billed against this agreement. How much money should we be making? How much money did it cost us? And then what are we actually making on the contract? And that'll give us a metric to say whether we need to increase the contract, approach the customer, or replace assets because they are high maintenance. Anyways, I hope this is helpful for you. Uh, made a bunch of mistakes, as always. Leave some feedback below and watch out for my next video. Thanks for watching.